The government promises new laws to make it easier to deport foreign criminals. The Home Secretary says she wants to prevent them remaining in Britain by claiming the right to a family life. She says the changes are necessary because some judges are ignoring government guidelines, but that's drawn strong criticism. The Home Secretary should not interfere with the judiciary. The independence of the judiciary is a very important part of our system and we should be proud of it. The horse meat scandal, now the boss of supermarket chain Iceland, blames pressure from schools and hospitals for cheaper food. Tens of thousands greet the Pope in St Peter's Square as he makes one of his last public appearances. And mind mapping how scientists are creating the most detailed picture yet of connections within the human brain. Hello, very good evening. New legislation has been promised to try to stop foreign criminals avoiding deportation by claiming the right to a family life. The Home Secretary, Theresa May, has accused some immigration judges of ignoring the latest government guidance, which makes clear a criminal's human rights should be balanced with the need to protect the public. Well, that's led to her being accused of interfering with the rule of law. Our political correspondent, Robin Brandt, reports. Which foreigners should be allowed in and which should be kicked out? For the Home Secretary, it's a never-ending headache. When it comes to those who commit a crime, it's not as simple as you might think. Amy Houston was 12 when she was run down and killed by Azo Mohammed Ibrahim. He was an Iraqi asylum seeker. He served jail time and then he was due to be deported. But a judge let him stay because he had two children in the UK with a British woman. He won because of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which guarantees a right to respect for private and family life. Now, that's proved controversial, and Theresa May's long campaigned for change. But we will change the immigration rules. To that was 2011. That Parliament has since toughened up the guidelines to judges. But writing in the Mail on Sunday, the Home Secretary said, some judges seem to believe that they can ignore Parliament's wishes when they think it came to the wrong conclusion. Home Office figures for 2011-12 show 177 foreign criminals avoided deportation, using this argument before the courts. Over a period of time, judges seem to have moved across to the idea that somehow this right to have a family life trumps all other rights. Uh, and the point she's making, Parliament made it very clear previously, uh, under previous legislation, that and the guidance particularly, uh, that they wanted to know that if a criminal commits a crime, then they should be in a much stronger position to be able to extradite them and kick them out. But in spite of that change in the guidelines, Theresa May thinks the system still favours some foreign criminals over British victims. Others, though, see a politician on the attack against judges who have to balance the law and the politics. They also have to be mindful of the incredible impact on, for example, the lives of children um, by disrupting family life. It's a hard one, a hard road to hoe, and judges have to have a certain amount of discretion. The Home Secretary should not interfere with the judiciary. The independence of the judiciary is a very important part of our system and we should be proud of it. So, Parliament is poised to take on the European Convention on Human Rights once again. Labour's criticised the Home Secretary for not getting on with the new law sooner. But until that happens, the right to a family life is something foreign criminals will use to try to stay here. OK, well, Robin's at the Home Office for us. So the Home Secretary might still want this new legislation. How easy, though, will it be to bring it in? Well, nothing's going to change soon because despite she's banging the drum and despite the protestations of the Home Secretary and her officials here at the Home Office, I'm told uh, tonight that they plan to publish their plans sometime this year for a new immigration bill. They wouldn't be more specific. And I think they're probably aiming to get it into law, if they can, by 2014. Now, it's not because of a lack of support. Labour back the Home Secretary on this. In fact, they never thought these uh, new guidelines, these new tougher guidelines, would be enough. And they criticised her uh, for not getting 
going sooner on uh, a new immigration bill. And I think, to be honest as well, there will be many on her own side in the Conservative Party delighted to hear her talking about wayward judges not abiding by uh, Parliament's uh, will. Uh, but nonetheless, the reality is there's going to be no overnight solution. It's not going to be a matter of months here. It could possibly be a year or more before the Home Secretary gets this new law. And between now and then, foreign criminals will be able to argue their right to a family life means they could stay in this country and there's very little the Home Secretary, frankly, can do about that. Robin, thank you. Well, councils have responded angrily to a claim from a leading supermarket that they're partly to blame for the horse meat scandal. The chief executive of Iceland, Malcolm Walker, says local authorities should stop awarding catering contracts for schools to the lowest bidder. Tomorrow, some of the UK's biggest supermarkets are to meet with the Environment Secretary, Owen Patterson, to discuss the crisis, as Ben Gagan now reports. Our food is being tested, and so is our confidence in it. Horse meat's been found in supermarket lasagna, beef burgers and bolognese sauce. It's also been picked up in school meals and hospital food. Today, a row has broken out about who is to blame. The boss of this big high street name said supermarkets had a fantastic reputation for food safety, and he accused local authorities of driving down price and quality. Local authorities award contracts based purely on one thing, price. So if you're looking to blame somebody who's driving down food quality, it's invisible. It's schools, it's hospitals, it's prisons, it's local authorities who are driving this down. Horse DNA was found in cottage pie sent to 47 schools in Lancashire. But local councils say their food standards are as good as anyone else's. Contracting with caterers for uh, food, whether it's in schools or any other public service, is something that is very carefully gone into, very carefully balanced up. We've got to get value for money. There are tight budgets. Today's spat between the boss of Iceland and local authorities is a sign of just how nervous people in the food industry are about losing the public's trust. Tomorrow, the government's holding a meeting here with the big supermarkets and food suppliers to find out what they're doing to reassure consumers. This crisis has led to calls for more regulation and better testing. One former government adviser said ministers had weakened the Food Standards Agency. The blame lies firmly with the government, with uh, Owen Patterson. He's the person who needs to explain why it was right at, in 2010 to reduce the Food Standards Agency and its authority, and perhaps now we need to go back to it. Last week, ministers in Brussels agreed that from March there would be EU-wide DNA tests on processed meat. The government says the FSA has all the resources it needs and that the testing system will be tougher. Too much of this system, which has been laid down, is based on trust on paper. And there is not enough testing. So the big victory we had at our meeting on Wednesday night is that the Commission and the other countries there, which have been endorsed by the Emergency Committee on Friday, is that there will be testing. Next week, the results of many more food tests will be published. For the moment, there is still no clear explanation of how horse meat got into our food. Ben Gagan, BBC News. The Foreign Office says it's investigating reports that a Briton was among a group of seven construction workers who've been kidnapped in northern Nigeria. The workers were taken by gunmen who stormed a residential compound belonging to a Lebanese construction company at Bauchi, 300 miles northeast of the capital, Abuja. Well, let's get more on this. Uh, we're joined by Africa correspondent Andrew Harding. He's in Johannesburg. Um, Andrew, what else do we know at this stage? Well, the scale of this attack is really worrying for Nigeria. According to the company that was targeted, they say up to 30 gunmen stormed their compound. They were well armed. They even had high explosives. They seized these seven foreigners, including an Italian, a Greek, and they say one British national, and disappeared with them. No groups claimed responsibility. It could be the work of a criminal gang. That's not uncommon in Nigeria, and normally companies quietly pay ransoms. But the scale and the ambition of this attack suggests it could be the work of Islamist militant groups, possibly a new one that has links to Al-Qaeda and which says it is targeting foreigners increasingly as a part of a revenge against the French military intervention to the north in Mali, which of course is still underway and which has triggered a lot of resentment against foreigners in the region. So a really worrying development for Nigeria right now. Okay, Angie, thank you. 
Pope Benedict has made one of his last public appearances before he steps down at the end of the month because of poor health. Tens of thousands of pilgrims cheered him when he blessed them from his study window overlooking St Peter's Square. He's asked them to continue praying for him and for the next Pope. Alan Little reports from Rome. For Romans, he's not only the leader of the Universal Church, he's also their local bishop. He says the Angelus prayer here every Sunday. It is routine. But this Sunday is far from routine. They came in their tens of thousands. They chanted his name. They greeted this quiet, unshowy man with a noisy, exuberant warmth. Pope Benedict has never been emotionally demonstrative. But these are his last days and they are emotionally loaded. His failing strength is evident now in his voice. Let me also thank, for you, thank you for the prayers and support you have shown me in these days. May God bless all of you. There hasn't been a moment quite like this at any time in the modern era because the faithful have turned up knowing that they're looking at the Pope for one of the very last times and that in less than two weeks from now he will disappear from public view for the rest of his life. In his own words, hidden from the world by necessity. He retreats now from a pontificate vexed from the start by crisis, not least over paedophile priests. He no longer has the strength to confront it. It is a moment of striking poignancy. Alan Little, BBC News, Vatican City. A British teenager who was lost in the Australian outback for three days says he believes he was on his last legs when he was rescued. Samuel Wood had disappeared on Tuesday after going out jogging from a cattle station in Queensland. Our correspondent Nick Bryant reports from Sydney. Lost in the outback for three days, but now reunited with his family. Sam Woodhead, the 18-year-old Londoner, who managed to stay alive in near 40-degree temperatures by drinking his own urine and taking tiny sips of contact lens solution that he happened to find in his rucksack. I just feel very fortunate to be uh, to still be alive and to be standing here. Um, and uh, I'm just really grateful for all the guys that helped out and all the team. He'd gone missing in some of Australia's harshest terrain, the Queensland outback, after setting off for a late afternoon jog from the remote farm where he was working, 80 miles from the town of Longreach. He was found only three miles away, but had become completely disorientated in the featureless scrubland. He was rescued by helicopter about 72 hours later, the third he'd seen fly over him. The pilot was just about to head off when he spotted a pair of rugby shorts that Sam had used to make an SOS sign. He was in a clearing waving his arms. He was um, quite, quite easy to spot when we flew over him. His mother Claire heard the happy news in mid-air as she flew from Britain to Australia. My prayers were answered as far as I was concerned. Sam's in Australia on a gap year and plans to pursue a career in the armed forces. He believes the training he'd already received at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst helped keep him alive. Nick Bryant, BBC News, Sydney. Scientists in America have begun a project to create the most detailed picture yet of how parts of the human brain are connected. They say that this brain map could reveal why some people are naturally scientific, musical or artistic. From Boston, our science correspondent Pab Ghosh has more. Over the centuries, scientists have probed it, scanned it and sliced it, but they still don't know how it works. This image shows a new way of looking at the human brain. Similar scans will be taken of 1,200 people in the US to see just how different parts of the brain are connected. I'm showing you the connections, the wires uh, that connect this point here to other parts of the human brain. The US effort is being supported by a team at Oxford University. It's thought that this wiring varies from person to person. It helps determine how the brain functions. It's going to tell us about uh, the healthy human brain um, and perhaps even explain human behaviour. For example, why some people like skydiving and others prefer sitting in front of the television. So to imagine this wiring map of the brain, just think about all the flights that leave major airports, like this one, Heathrow, that I'm about to set out from. Just as my route is one of hundreds connecting airports across the world, so too does the brain have connections some of which go to important areas such as our vision centres, 
like a major airport hub, and others which go to smaller centres of activity, such as Logan Airport in Boston. Which is my final destination. And it's here that researchers are looking into the human brain as never before. There you go. Here at Massachusetts General Hospital, scientists have built one of the most powerful brain scanners in the world. Now they're going to scan my brain. And here's the result, the important pathways of my brain in vivid colour. These, this paired structure, these large green arcs in the centre, are called the cingulum bundle, left and right. And they're very important for processing emotion. The hope is to learn how the human mind works and what happens when it goes wrong. We have all these mental health problems and our method for understanding them is, has really not changed over a hundred years. We don't have imaging methods as we do for the heart to tell what's really going on. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we could get in there and see these things? Scientists expect to discover much more about the brain and the essence of what makes us human. Palad Ghosh, BBC News, Boston. Fascinating stuff. OK, sport now. And for a full round-up of all the day's action, here's Karthi Nyan-Zegram at the BBC Sports Centre. Karthi, hello.